After two years of this little rigid table saw, it was time to finally do something about my crosscut capabilities. The best way to do that is with a crosscut sled. Now, I had to resist the urge to go full-blown, sap-blooded American and build mine with a half sheet of plywood like some of my fellow YouTubers. Taking some practice passes first for some reason, I started the project by cutting the base of the sled from 3 quarter inch plywood before cutting the front fence from the same material. I plan on using this jig mostly for small parts, so I built a smallish sled. It might even be the perfect size for... Possibly you! So if you want to build one of these bad boys too, I have some plans available on my website. While the two halves of the front fence were drying, I made the runners for the miter slots. I like to use plywood since it's less susceptible to humidity changes. Now the trick with making runners is to go excruciatingly slow and sneak up to the perfect width. The goal is for the runner to slide in the slot easily with absolutely zero side to side slot. Once that's dialed in, I ripped four or five more so they're on hand next time I need to make a jig. Three quarter inch plywood is a little too thick to use as a runner though, but ripping it in half of the bandsaw gives me two perfectly sized runners. My version of a crosscut sled has runners in both miter slots, but one of them is a friction fit and removable. After tilting the blade to 45 degrees, I marked where the first miter slot would be, then moved it to the left and marked the second miter slot. With that mark, I could start cutting the dado for the removable runner, very carefully sneaking up to a tight friction fit. Why is one of them removable? I wanted my sled to cut 45 degrees on the end and 90 degrees in the middle. Normally to do this, you just use one miter slot runner, but I'll be making 90 degree cuts more often than 45, and I like the stability of two runners, so a removable one allows me to switch back and forth easily. Despite all my talk about sneaking up on the fit, I ended up going too wide with my dado, but a strip of painter's tape returned it to a tight fit. The second runner is attached by lifting it slightly above the height of the table with handy shims, gluing it with CA glue, then aligning by using the removable runner before screwing it in place. The dado on the fence for the T-track is cut at the table saw as well. Zero clearance inserts are all the rage these days and I didn't want to be left out. I opted to go with half inch plywood over MDF though, because I could. It's actually because of magnets. With the fence temporarily held in place with tape and CA glue, I could raise the blade and find where it hits on the fence. Using one of the inserts I made, I marked the area that needed to be removed, then made a quick straight edge jig for my palm router and hogged out the waste, squaring the corners with a chisel piece of scrap works great for marking consistently. Small holes in CA glue hold magnets in place and screws on the back of the insert hold it in place. Forgetting how badly plywood can chip out gave me the opportunity to fix a happy accident with wood putty and a sweet, sweet danger strike. I chose to cut the dado for the base T-track with a router, mainly just to switch things up I think. This could easily have been done on the table saw, but it might have messed up my danger stripe. I guess I could have done the stripe after the T-track was installed, but it wouldn't be a crafts right video without at least two screw ups. And speaking of Crafts Right and Makery, are you a subscriber? If so, air high five. If not, maybe I'll catch you in the next one after you click that button and ring the bell.
The five cut squaring method made getting a dead accurate 90 degree fence pretty effortless. I'll link to the video explaining how that's done in the description. 0 0.9820. 0.9810. Good enough for me. The back fence of a table saw sled doesn't do much other than help hold the base together. I wanted to change that by integrating a detachable extension stop lock. The meat of the back fence is cut from 3 quarter inch plywood, while the extension arm, or potatoes, is made from half inch, which I cut an eighth of an inch wider and four inches longer to allow for kerf. I sliced off the main extension arm, then glued the offcut to the thicker plywood and the three inch cleat to the arm. Magnets will hold it in place when not in use. A good trick when installing magnets is to group them in pairs, place one, then flip the other and place it. This way you don't mix up the polarities and rip a hole in space time. Using a spacer to keep the two fences parallel, I attached the back fence, screwing into the three quarter inch plywood from underneath. This extension arm lengthens the capacity of the sled and its repeatability a good amount. The 45 degree side of the sled was cut before moving on to the last step, installing the blade guard. But I've never been a fan of those massive, lumpy bricks tacked onto the sled fences, and this little red guy wasn't going to be much of a deterrent. But Mr. Stabby McPokerton III will make sure I don't rest my extremities anywhere near him, or the path of the blade. After a coat of Osmo Pollux and a fresh paint job, she's ready to go. I'm still on the fence, whether or not I'll make a DIY flip stop for this sled or not, but in the meantime, on to the next one.